welcome to Electric Liberty Land here on the Lions of Liberty podcast, your weekly shot of culture, comedy, and liberty with your host, Brian McWilliams. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to Electric Liberty Land 238. You'll notice I'm wearing my old school Lions of Liberty PBR styling shirt today. Of course, you can get yours at lionsofliberty.store. Highly recommend that. Also, keep your eyes peeled. We're going to have a brand new shirt. Pretty funny shirt. I'm not going to give it away quite yet, but that's going to be coming out very soon. We're going to be loading that into the store, lionsofliberty.store, which of course is where you can also get all your fantastic t-shirts like Taxation is Death, like Wax On, Tax Off, Mr. Miyagi shirt that's hilarious, Conversation Starter. And uh, like I said, this new shirt's coming in. I think we're going to tie it to a little, a little promo action too. So I'll keep you posted on that front. Also, before I get into the show today, I do want to mention... The Burn and Daylight podcast from a good friend, Matt McKinley. You guys have heard me talk about this a little bit before, but Matt is a legitimate real-life cowboy. He's out there. He's getting on the cattle. He's getting on the horse. He's getting them out to pasture. He's getting them back into pasture. He's making sure they don't die. But in the meantime, he's slaying a liberty. He's talking to other friends, talking to other cowboys, cowgirls, cowpokes, everything across the spectrum of liberty and of learning that lifestyle. So it's fascinating stuff. I dare you to find a more unique podcast out there. So again, that's Burning Daylight. Check it on out. Um, and one more thing I want to mention, guys. I mentioned this last show, but you out there, if you're a philosopher, if you're into liberty thinking, uh, if you're into economics, if you're into the practical applications of our philosophy, I want you to go ahead reach out to the Austrian Center because they've got the 10th annual conference coming up and that is available at austrianconference.org. Uh, September 19th is the cutoff for papers and uh, I'm actually going to be doing a show pretty soon with uh, Frederico who invited me to come and take part in this. I think that's probably going to be mid-April so you get to hear from him. He is an Argentinian by birth but is not living there currently. However, he told me about the large Argentinian libertarian populations there so I'm curious to hear more about this and then of course what they're doing in Austria which is where the conference is taking place this year so again get those papers in come join me in Austria I'll be doing podcasts live there as well as some uh, pre-recorded ones it's gonna be a blast I'm really looking forward to it and uh, the conference itself I believe is the second through the fifth so I'm gonna be flying out on the first of November um yeah well now that that's out of the way <laughs> Guys, welcome to the show. I have a really interesting interview coming up later today, and that's going to be with Jeremy Lee Quinn, who I met at Reason. You'll hear more about that as I get into that and segue into that segment later on uh, and talk to him about basically, you know, like the title of the episode, I titled it Dances with Extremists, kind of like a Dances with Wolves thing, as he has been able to document what's going on, kind of like, uh, you know, Tim Pool had done back in the day, kind of like News to Share had done uh, and does. And uh, Jeremy's out there in Los Angeles, on the ground, amidst the Antifa, amidst the Proud Boys, and with this Korean We Spa nonsense, madness, just, I mean, the epitome of a leftist cause being taken to its extreme, and they are extremists after all, but taken to its extreme, and over what is a pretty legitimate complaint from somebody, either, even if you're all for transgender rights, you could see how this might be a problem for people that are just sitting in this spa. I'm turn my lights down a little too bright here wash myself out. But before we get into that, what I'd love to do is talk to you guys real quick up front about this nonsense, batshit insanity with Jen Psaki and uh, Saki. I still don't know how to say this chick's name. Coming out and laying it bare just how insane the government is working with these social media agencies. So let me play a quick clip for her and then I'm going to come back and I want to talk to you guys just about how, I mean, this is like I said, it's laying it bare and it ties into everything that they've been saying to lead up to this. I mean, we, we saw this coming. So here is Jen Psaki. I'm going to blow this up and play this clip for you. Actually, hold on. Before I do, I got to double check. So it was every damn time I go to hit the clip and then I forgot to hit the audio button. There we go. Share audio. So annoying. I have to do it every time. It makes me furious every single time. All right, here we go. So here's Jen Psaki talking about social media and Slowly clamp it down on misinformation. 
providing uh, for, for Facebook or other platforms to measure and publicly share the impact of misinformation on their platform uh, and the audience it's reaching. Uh, also with the public, with all of you, um, to create robust enforcement strategies that bridge their properties and provide transparency about rules. You shouldn't be banned from one platform and not others uh, if you are for uh, uh, providing misinformation out there. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, let's make sure that we provide, sorry, let's make sure that, that if you get banned from one platform for misinformation, which is what the government wants to do right now and is working hand in hand with Facebook, you've got, <coughs> excuse me, you've got your extremist warnings popping up. You've got Twitter naming people. And, and again, these, oh, these are all sharing with the government, right? Everybody that was involved in the Capital Six riots, they got their information turned over to the FBI toot sweet. Yeah, say goodbye to your privacy. You might have been having a private conversation about it. Maybe you're just going to visit. Maybe you said, this is going to be quite the shit show. I need to check this out. I want to see what's going on. Maybe, like Jeremy, who's coming on later in the show, you were there as a journalist, but you're not a credentialed media anymore. And he was. You know, he was on TV here in Los Angeles as a, an anchor for some time. Maybe you're not part of the establishment media anymore. But you're talking, you're researching, maybe you're looking at the event online, you RCP yes to go to this riot because you want to cover it and you want the information to be sent to you. Now, your information shared with the government. Now the FBI is knocking on your door. Now the FBI is arresting you for daring to be in a public space where some other people did something that the government frowns upon. And now your life's over. But these people... Right? You see how this is going. They're already looking to crack down on quote unquote extremism, which is an amorphous phrase, which is ill defined, just like the Obama usage of enemy combatant. This is Biden's version of enemy combatant. This is the indefinable phrase extremist. Extreme to who? If you're a government stooge, virtually anything is extreme to you. Because you want people to fall in line. You want people to take their vaccines. You want people to obey everything that you say because you are the moral high ground. You are the arbiter of what is logical. And most important to these people, they are the arbiters of truth. Now, we've seen how dangerous it is when the state is the arbiter of truth. We've seen it in socialist countries. We've seen it in Cuba going on right now. We see it in China and how they control the news media, how they, how they doctor information coming out, how they censor information coming in by blocking sites like Google, by blocking what people can access in that country because they control the flow of information. Look to North Korea. Do we really think it's a great idea that government becomes the arbiter of what is in truth, uh, what is factual. I mean, Kim Jong-un in the newspapers there is a great and glorious leader, a brilliant mind that hasn't starved people and killed people for no good reason. I'm sure that describes him as a hunk about town and tells people that the perfect ideal weight is 340 pounds eating nothing but pork ribs and boning uh, harem girls all day. It's the Kim Jong-un lifestyle. How could you argue against it? But that's the truth in North Korea. So the Biden administration wants to make sure that they control the truth here. And they can't just control the truth with one platform. They can't just control the truth by virtue of all of the people that have worked in the government that are former CIA agents, former FBI, former NSA, or just good old former flax that now were embedded in all of our mainstream media platforms. No, they have to go to step farther. They have to take it to the social media and make sure they're working hand and fist with them to ban people from not just one, as Jen was so kindly sharing with us, no, no, you should be barred from all of them. That means that no longer does any social media platform have its own an uh, anonymity, right? An an anonymity. <laughs> the anonymity horror, where Brian can't say the word anonymity, and then, uh, I don't know, who is that? I can't remember who was in that uh, that remake of that horror film, horror film famous uh, Amityville Horror. Great film. Getting off track. So anyway, you know, they, they can't allow these companies to decide for themselves what truth is out there, what's misinformation that should qualify somebody from being kicked off the platform. Meanwhile, the government's been lying to us the whole time. We have Fauci on tape lying to the American population, to their faces, about the efficacy of masks, about herd immunity. And he has admitted as such. He said specifically, I lied to the American public about this. Oh, because I didn't want there to be a run on masks, right? Meanwhile, I just think he was telling the truth on masks anyway. They don't do anything. The virus is too small to go through them unless they're the incredibly hard to find surgical style masks that nobody's mandated anyway. You can shove a tampon uh, wrapper over your mouth and walk around in LA where we have mask mandates again and no one's going to say boo to you. 
But we saw them lie to us. They, the government lies to us constantly. And about COVID particularly, they lied and they censored information that later came out to be true or is looking to be likely true. The Wuhan lab is an example I've mentioned many times. So now they have to work between all of the social media factors. And Jen and the Biden administration make sure that if you get kicked off one, you get kicked off all. Right, Just like they deplatformed Alex Jones across all of them en masse in a day in a coordinated fashion, that's what our government wants to be able to do to you. So even if you're using Facebook just to catch up with your grandma and post pictures of your kids, just because you're using Instagram to share pictures of your baby with a small amount of people and family, just because you, maybe you use, uh, what, Medium to write short stories on. Well, too bad. Fuck you, says the government. You dared to tweet something that we think is misinformation. You dared to question the efficacy of the vaccines. You dared to point out that the Delta variant isn't as, da as dangerous and deadly as the initial variant and that people shouldn't be scared of it. Well, that's misinformation. We think that they should be scared of it because what we think the risk level is, is what everybody has to think. So say goodbye. I'm sorry, all of your social platforms are gonna be canceled down. And we don't care about your objections. There will be no court of law here because that's the beauty of these people's arrangement between public government and private companies. They very cleverly developed a workaround, haven't they? Wherein, if they're working with private companies, pressuring them, working with them so that they have regulations that are favoring these companies, you know that behind the scenes, there's some quid pro quo going on here. Well, now they've very cleverly gotten around any First Amendment protections They've gotten around Fourth Amendment protections because these social media companies are voluntarily censoring and sharing your information. The government isn't forcing them to do that, right? No, no, this is a collaboration. And because these are quote-unquote private companies, which they clearly are not any longer, said this for many, many months, clearly are not any longer private companies. But because they're technically private companies, ah, well, they can go ahead and get rid of you and you can't say boo. And of course, we're talking now about getting rid of Section 230. That's what the GOP is crying for. This is a bad idea because under Section 230, this is also what's kind of protecting people from putting out alternative information, alternative facts. All right, if you can be deplatformed for the six, the government can get even more ingrained and involved in what can and can't be regulated insofar as speech is concerned. So while I'm not happy about what's going on right now, the market has to come up with a solution. The market has to provide a counter to this that does have free speech at its center. The market has to find a way that we can decentralize these things so that the government can't shut them down, no matter what threats they make. Well, sorry, it's a decentralized computing cloud. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to find it? How are you going to shut it down, government? This is the way forward. Because relying on regulation, relying on laws to protect us here clearly doesn't work. The First Amendment is clearly under attack. We've got Section 230 that's under attack right now. It's probably going to be removed, repealed, and then replaced with something a million times worse. We've seen what happens with First Amendment rights in regards to posting content. What happened with, you know, what was it Panda and CISPA? I mean, all of these things that are always in the ways because we have to protect people from misinformation. We have to protect the children from online sex predators and sex trafficking. Who ends up getting screwed? The everyday person. People that legitimately are bad actors are going to find a way to do things no matter what. Better to have this stuff out in the open. Better to be able to find it easily. Then you can debunk it. Then you can argue it. Then you can have your way. But the government and these COVID cultists know that what they're putting out there, not just with COVID, but with critical race theory, with any sort of white nationalist extremism bullshit saying that this is the greatest threat to humanity in America that's ever been, easily is debunked when it's out in the open and you have a frank, critical discussion of it. But that's the opposite of what they want. Now, while we're talking about extremism, let me go right into this interview with Jeremy Lee Quinn, and then I'll be back because I want to wrap up some other things. I want to talk a little bit about what's going on with COVID lockdowns over in Europe, mass protests, happy to see it. So we'll talk about that, and then a couple idiots of the week, and we'll call it a day. All right, so as promised, I am uh, bringing in an independent journalist and uh, and someone actually who I coincidentally had just met over at Reason, where I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago at the invite of Angela McArdle at the Reason Foundation for the L.A. County Libertarian Party. He is a, uh, like I said, independent journalist who has been active in documenting extremism. He is the host of the Unblocked Live podcast, and also you can find his work, especially 
coming together a culmination of a lot of the work he did in 2020 over at publicreport.org. And that is reporter Jeremy Lee Quinn. Welcome to Electric Liberty Land. Hey, thanks for having me. You know, it's so tough to get the right or the left to listen. Sometimes you have to find uh, people who are independents that uh, are willing to hear it. So I appreciate yeah, being exactly. on here. Well, you know, it's it's tricky. Finding the truth is always a difficult thing in uh, in any time. But as you and I were kind of chatting about before the show, it becomes exceptionally difficult to find in an era when we are seeing the absolute utmost of divisiveness and extremism, which, of course, just plays into even more divisiveness because it feeds both sides narratives. And that polarization seeps right into social media, uh, which is the great incubator for all of this animus, which is brewing and gets one sided coverage from either the right or the left with no nuance whatsoever in between. And that's what we saw primarily in Los Angeles on Saturday, July the 17th and two Saturdays before on July mm -hmm. 3rd, a basic manufactured uh, outrage machine at work in which two sides were, uh, especially this last Saturday, intent on taking to the streets and, and, and somehow beating on each other. It so. certainly seems that way. But before we get into that, because I do want to hear, and like I said, Jeremy was at this, we're going to talk about the We Spa in Koreatown. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that and you know, my, my take on it at first glance. And then we'll get into what you've seen on the ground there uh, over these two weeks. But before we get into that, tell me a little bit about what brought you to independent journalism. You know, what made you want to focus on extremism as a topic, as you've been doing, and just kind of your overall uh, thoughts on where we are right now. Well, I've always been part of the media and I've worked, I used to be an on-camera journalist and I got tired of that pretty quick because in five years of six years, seven years of local news, you've covered every type of story and, and it's not as sort of thrilling as one might imagine. Uh, and, and so I moved on and I, I, I went behind the camera and, and was mainly producing, I was working for Univision in LA and I got furloughed last May. And so I was hanging around in Santa Monica, California on May the 31st. I came out from surfing and I saw helicopters overhead and that's that's the the big weekend of the george floyd uh protest mm -hmm. and riots in los angeles and they ransacked and when i say they it was organized community of leftist activists uh commonly called antifa and uh that but they're different autonomous groups that get together in, in los angeles we have an autonomous anarchist front that uh has a, a a twitter account the socal antifa account is new it only sprung up in april so mm -hmm. those these folks that consider themselves radical leftists are aligned with anarchist uh action direct action they call it or antifa anti-fascist direct action uh they've kind of in la have just sort of percolated about the activist scene and they really came together in a big way uh with the we spa protest but you first saw the manifestations of that on may the 31st at least i did in person and then the night before on may 30th was when uh you saw cop cars burning on fairfax and businesses burning thereafter that evening on melrose so their presence has been known but it's been a kind of a mystery to mainstream media because it's dangerous to cover the they're very hostile to media you get kicked mm -hmm. out so a lot of companies especially uh on their weekend they're not looking to send their weekend crew which is right. sometimes more, a bunch more, of freelancers. A lighter fare yeah well freelancers and lighter fare right you're not you're exactly <laughs> exactly them into the jaws of the beast <laughs> yeah send them into you know the 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 antifa uh, anarchist right. protest uh in santa monica no it's not how it's been working out so we're in we're in somewhat of a media blackout especially when you cover this stuff you know, Fox News will refer to it in the, sing the singular, Antifa, as if it's monolithic. And it really isn't. What we're dealing with is 20 to 25 local stories across the country where you have their, your local scene and local groups which are organizing over Twitter. Now, the response to that are these right-wing militant groups, which show up in the helmets and bear spray and... Mm -hmm. uh, and baseball bats, as we saw uh, uh, July, one individual had on July the 3rd in front of the Wee, Wee Spa. But as far as breaking down what happens, the media is especially terrible at deciphering it. And a lot of it has to do with activist accounts, Antifa-aligned press. These are the people who show up in black block, you know, where they're dressed head to toe in black, mm -hmm. and they have a black helmet that says press. I've never... <laughs> 
worn a black helmet in all my years right. of working yeah. in media that says press, you know? So it's very easy to, to figure out who the Antifa aligned press are because they have helmets that say press. And by the way, are these people, I mean, I don't know if you've had a chance to talk to any of these people just interacting oh, yeah. in general. So are they, I mean, are these just people that are pure Antifa that decided to bring out a camera or are they people that have, you know, gone to journalism school that just, you know, fresh out of college, they got wrapped up in the movement. Like who are these press people? Are they, yes. are, are they legitimate in any way or are they just pure spokespeople that the, the media is globbed onto? They are ideologues, and I would imagine most of them to be co college graduate based on what I have seen. Two of them that are well known, there's about a dozen in the LA scene, but two of them are well known to, you know, talk about their education and sort of, you know, <laughs> throw that out. And, and right. uh, they, they come after me because I, you know, I, I, they don't know a lot of my career as an on camera journalist. I actually covered anarchist actions at UC Berkeley 2007. There was a giant tree sit where they tried to stop the building of the, uh, sports athletic facility and uh, they all sat in the trees and so I've, I've been on this you know through Occupy Wall Street when I lived in New York City I've been on this sort of leftist action for a long time and covering it but under the radar so when I first came on the New York Times wrote a story about me and uh, uh, featured me in like the beginning of October and I just got clobbered online oh, by sure. the, these folks were yeah. coming out of the woodwork there's a there's a big anarchist leftist uh, they have a radio component they're out of basically the, one of the founders was out of UC Berkeley and uh, it's called it's going down and they they just they they collaborated me and just well I mean, it's all misinformation to, to sort oh, of, of course, they, yeah. they don't they don't deal with the content they only do deal with defaming the spokesperson so that so as to shut you up silence you and you will never talk about what they are doing again and it works we've seen that it yeah. works they've seen that it works that's where I was going to ask you, you know, we're talking about Antifa and these groups, and they're definitely, a lot of them are localized, but I have seen, you know, there's like kind of these kits or kind of guidelines, or like you said, these communicative patterns that they use to rally everybody together. And I was going to ask you if you've seen, you know, because there have been discussions of people being busted different places, especially with George Floyd riots or something like that, where they, there have been some people documented that have been traveling around, kind of like when people follow fish, but these people follow destruction and divisiveness. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's certainly true. And it's certainly easier <laughs> up and down the West Coast. You can almost call right, it the yeah. an anarchy corridor if you're going in between the San Francisco Bay Area all the way up to Seattle through Portland, mm -hmm. you know, and then it comes down into uh, somewhat there's a small scene in San Diego and LA's has always been, you know, smattered about the activist community. So this was a big sort of entree for this new SoCal Antifa group. But as I said, when I saw Santa Monica got ra get ransacked on the 31st, people were doing taking coordinated action flyers were going viral essentially the techniques the anarchist tactics which are called direct action tactics where you're covering your face you're breaking windows as an act of protest this all went viral through memes that were shared over and over again throughout that week that's why you had people in santa monica doing the exact same thing that was happening mm -hmm. across the country or in the midwest uh, in certain cities or in minneapolis or wherever it's because the tactics themselves and the talking points of don't talk to the fbi or don't talk to the cops your camera is a cop diversity of tactics we don't police the protest no police uh, peace police that's that's what mm -hmm. they that that was the big talking point and it has been it does come from a sort of university dogma i i, I have um you know actor friends who were younger than me who are uh, in university and they were they were they were sort they're all repeating themselves about the police being slave catchers and this and that mm -hmm. and i got the same talking points being repeated over and over on in this sort of drone drone like fashion uh i had a persecutor a guy who went after me uh, back in Huntington Beach, I was covering a right, what was supposed to be a right wing protest, but then the, uh, if you're on the West Coast, it's the leftists it's, that manifest. Yeah, they seem to vastly they, over, yeah, they, they completely. They have the numbers. Exactly. Yeah, they're completely overrun every single time. Yeah, yeah. And so I was at one of these uh, where I actually saw my first neo Nazi, like an actual one with a tattoo, <laughs> because other, uh, you know, Nazi and fascist are thrown around among these groups as accusations very liberally. And. Um, there's rarely any evidence, but this was evidence. There was a guy with a Nazi tattoo who showed up to Huntington Beach on the supposed White Lives Matter uh, yeah, protest. Yeah. And, and at doing so, and, and me covering it, somebody took a picture of me. This is one of the leftist Antifa-aligned press 
published it. I didn't have my uh, my mask on and said, here mm -hmm. is right wing capital stormer, Jeremy Lee Quinn. <laughs> and it's because I was at the Capitol and I was doc. I, I, I'm doing the big heresy, which is I'm, I'm documenting both sides of this. So I was like, at the yeah, Capitol on January 6th. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. How, I do, how dare I do journalism th on that yeah. way. And uh, this guy, it turns out, was a 2018 UC Berkeley uh, graduate student in journalism. And, and I only found that out because wow. he went too far and started harassing like, like uh, where I was an intern, uh, you know, 15 years ago. So, mm -hmm. you know, so, you, it, it's just they're really on your case. I mean, yeah. You have to wonder, you know, talking about journalism, you have to wonder if he's coming out, if he's a 2018 graduate in journalism. And I guess from what I've been hearing, you know, of course, I, I was never a journalism major. I was never even a communications major, despite the fact that's what I do for a career. But I was an English major. But I wonder, you know, what are they teaching at these journalism schools then? If this guy can come out and have such a perverted view of how you tell the truth that he's willing to defame you, that he's willing to twist whatever narrative that, you know, he needs to meet his ideological goals. I mean, is this something that you think they're teaching in journalism school now? That, well, that, that, that your bias is the story more than the story is the story. That that is the big question. I I it, I seem to get the feeling through university professors that I've spoken to and 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 talked to that it is something of a heresy if you're going to criticize any of the activism or militancy of the left and and mm -hmm. you will get eaten alive. Uh, and I I've seen this time sort of time and time again. People are afraid to uh, actually if you act, to actually have the real discussion about how the cycle of violence really is fueled from the left and the right, both both taking the opportunity to propagandize against the other and to use violence and then point the finger at the other. This has been going on actually in my lifetime since the late eighties when you had the, the, it was a very subcultural thing back then where you had anti-racist skinheads going up against mm -hmm. neo-Nazi skinheads across the country in a network <laughs> called ARA, anti-racist action. Very confusing visually. <laughs> very, yes, when everybody's wearing the same Somebody thing. Somebody put well, a hat on for Frank's sake, I mean, <laughs> come on. Well, that's, that's what it is now is it's very confusing because everybody's just dressing <laughs> head to toe in black and putting on helmets and now right. you have the right <laughs> appropriating you know in a huge way some of these black block tactics and then and that's mm -hmm. what we saw was it got very confusing on july 3rd at the we spa especially yeah, when the perfect. fighting broke out on both sides and somebody actually had a knife in black block and it was hard to tell who that was and i will explain that um yeah well before we get into that i just want to talk i just want to give people a little bit of the background here so in a nutshell what jeremy's been documenting the last couple weeks here in la is that there's a place called the Wee Spa, and it's a, in Koreatown. This is a traditional Korean spa wherein the men and the women are separated. Uh, it's you know very traditional, and they, and they try to be very stringent about that, and it's usually respected. Uh, what ended up happening, allegedly anyway, is that uh, a man came over who identified as a woman, but still had all of the equipment, as they say, and went on the women's side where there are women there expecting not to be exposed to this, as well as children. Uh, I've been some, from one report I read. You can have teenage, teenagers, I, I think children are allowed to be in the yeah. Wii Spa in the public bathing areas as long as they're accompanied by an adult. You know, I'm right. I'm part Asian. When I was a kid, the Japanese have a, something called onsen, which is very similar. And I, mm -hmm. I did, it's a, it's a, you know, a different experience for us Americans. Uh, but, but they are traditionally divided by anatomical presentation now it's a very mm. normal thing that all the penises are on one side you know right, yeah and they're they're, they're they're quarantined over there you don't right, you don't yeah. sort of have them usually you know coming that way so so the question becomes this this woman who who was not an activist but is religious um she records herself the second time she comes to the desk of the Wii spot to complain because the first time they're not doing anything about it they say we can't because we're not allowed to discriminate against gender identification. She said, what do you mean? This is a full-on man, according to her perspective. Now, mm -hmm. I did ask the lawyer, I said, did this person ever identify themselves as transgender? And the lawyer said, no, that the only thing that this person said to uh, the woman who's known as Angel, that's a mm -hmm. uh, pseudonym that she's using because she doesn't want to get harassed. She's gotten some death threats over all this. Uh, she's filed a lawsuit about that as well as a police report uh, with LAPD on July 6th that was filed in regards to indecent exposure for this mm -hmm. June 23rd incident. But so, so only that uh, the, the individual said to Angel, don't harass me. That's all. But there was no declaration that this was a, a transgender person. It could have been a man like, you know, you or I just sort of taking advantage and exploiting 
the uh, the vulnerability in in this policy. So mm -hmm. she started activist. Long story short, what happens is I think it was a, a another Instagram account rips it that has fifty thousand followers. This is a Latino exit um, the Democratic Party type mm -hmm. Instagram page. They rip it. They repost it's too it. Too bad it Latinx gets... has been uh, already taken by the left. They could have used right, Latinx right. Let, you know, so I think like this Black, was like, like <laughs> yes, no, this was Latinx it or something like this. Yeah, yeah. And so this account publishes it. Then it gets the eyes on it of, you know, Tucker Carlson, Daily Caller repurposes it. It starts to make the rounds along the activist right. What happens? Somebody stages a anti-pedophile like gets the, the rhetoric gets dialed up to like this whole other yeah. level of anti-pedophilia and then you have the save the children viral hashtag that went viral august 2020 those uh f activist folks trump supporters anti-vaxxers everybody's starting to get in on it and then uh i don't want to generalize but i'm just saying you get the cross section of yeah, you can the see activist the right to jump on that right yeah and they say they're going to show up on July 3rd. Antifa, the new so SoCal Antifa account, along with the Autonomous Anarchist Front of, you know, of Los Angeles here, uh, and another, a new account called Southwest Liberation Front, they all tweet, let's show up two hours early. They do. What happens, a young kid shows up first, I say kid, but at mid-20s, um, who is a Hispanic gay man, they, and he's saying... He's actually advocating for third spaces. He's getting booed by Antifa. Hmm. Uh, event, you know, eventually someone, an organizer, actually comes and tear, takes his sign away that says, um, one of his signs said, uh, trans activism erases women's rights. And hmm. so that was his stance. They take the signs away. He escalates it in a very bizarre way. A guy in black block, block takes one of his signs. He just goes to his bag, grabs pepper spray, walks up to the guy like this. The guy <laughs> kind point of blank. <laughs> yeah, point blank. They get into it. Next thing you know, he's on the sidewalk with four dudes in black block just laying punches right, on him. Right, which kick, is the way I've seen typically sidewalk. Antifa operate is that they gang up uh, as much as they possibly can. Yeah. And so the clip that we're about to see is in uh, about 45 minutes, because that happened at 944 AM mm -hmm. on July 3rd. That was the first melee of aggression. This now is 1028 AM, this clip. And we're going to see a, a preacher in a blue shirt, and I'll explain it to the audio listeners. So what we see here, there's some Antifa press there with the cameras in the middle, big camera. They're well known. Actually, all those cameras. They're th throwing stuff at this guy in a blue shirt. You will later see pictures of him bloodied when they go after him with a skateboard. And he just seems to be backing away. These, you know, Antifa at this point is definitely there's a group of them surrounding this guy. Uh, you know, there's got to be 25 people easily following him, and he's just walking away at this point. And there's another folk here uh, in the foreground. That's a Hispanic fellow with a Jesus Trust Jesus shirt. Now, as I pan backward in a second, you're going to see the rest of the mob. I'm focusing on these two, who will both later get attacked. Mm. And you just see numerous people in black block and press recording. And that's a woman with a skateboard who uses it as a weapon later, as far as pushing out just normies, too. You know, people who mm -hmm. aren't. Um, evangelical. So they're forcing you to take sides, basically. They're, like, they're saying you're either protesting with them or against them. You're not even allowed to watch. You're not even allowed to watch. Exactly. If you're not Antifa aligned press, you are you are smoked out and uh, forced to go away. And they have the flag there. Now here's where it starts to heat up. What we see is down the street they have a guy to the curb. He's okay. laying down. He's he's going to be bloodied. They've stolen his his banner and his megaphone. This guy in the green shirt. I saw him doing the first push uh, pushing. He's going to come in with a hook in a minute. Right here, boom, pops uh, a guy. Just sucker, just sucker punched him. Sucker punched him. This guy has an anarchist tattoo, by the way, on his arm of a, um, a bird called the Storm Petrel, which is an anarchist. Now, someone just came in and then just, and just hit one of the Antifa press on the helmet. Now he's doing a victory dance. Now that guy turns out to be... Um, now this guy's getting up. I mean, it's just, it's just madness. Nobody knows who's attacking who. Right, yeah. And there, the one guy, the guy that had swung the pipe, had, you know, he comes in... He attacked the Antifa guy, then he run, then he backs away. But like I said, he's got helmets on, everybody's masks on. Yeah, it's just, how do you know it's who anybody chaos. is at this point? How do you know yeah. who is who? And yeah. the guy that comes in with a pipe had just, 
he was a friend of the organizer who I described, the young, you know, 20 something mm-hmm. who got beat on the sidewalk. He was a friend of his or a colleague. He shows up in this flannel. I call it Patriot block because it's black mm-hmm. block with something signifying patriotism. He had a backwards hat that said Patriot. So mm-hmm. <laughs> he made it pretty yep. clear uh, <laughs> what side he was on. But the first thing he does is he whacks on the back a Newsmax reporter by accident. Yeah. So he's a right-wing guy, comes in. The first thing he does is, is he whacks a guy named James who works at News, Newsmax on the back. Then he realizes he, he just, you know, essentially took on ideological friendly, you know, friendly fighter. And so he then goes after the, the Antifa press guy, um, you know, the guy with the, the press helmet, and they wax him. So all yeah, that happens. Just, it does strike me as, as extra cowardly. And, and I view the majority of these as cowardly acts in general. You know, not not to say yeah. protesting is a cowardly act, but anything using violence as your go-to, intimidation as a go-to, to me is an unbelievably cowardly tactic, and especially when you outnumber people, as these people often do. But this guy going up and just whacking people in general, especially people that are reporting, they are the least likely people to be able to defend themselves. And of course, the key, the least likely people to be paying attention to anybody trying to hit them with a pipe. So Right. And especially, and you see this time and time again, which is people get hit from behind. They're, they're, yeah. They sort of have tunnel vision on what's going on in front of them. People are trying to take things from them. And then, boom, someone comes from behind and whacks them. So cowardly is, uh, you couldn't choose a better word than cowardly, especially when you see this stuff then repeat itself online, the way that they go after people using anonymous accounts, which don't have their names. And then those anonymous accounts are used as sources for, you know, Newsweek published a story on July 17th, and they used an account called, you know, right wing, a right wing watch account, which is an Mm -hmm. anonymous Antifa aligned account. And they use that for their big headline about proud boys, you know, (laughs) taking on, uh, uh, tr- transphobic protest or you know so so you get these talking points and there was there was no indication that that anybody maybe there was a, a proud boy that is possible but it's 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 sort of as you were saying a, a catch-all now that the, the antifa aligned mm-hmm. protesters if they can you know spook you with a proud boys boogeyman which they did yep. all through 2020 then you they can distract you enough and the press eats it up so much that oh, they yeah. thought that using the okay sign was some symbol for white oh, supremacy that was ridiculous. You know? oh god yeah. yeah there was a guy a poor uh, i think it was a city worker that was just outside of his car just had his fingers roughly into okay shape and they i think the guy got fired from his job i mean it's insane I, and it is particularly um, cowardly because they are successful um, at going after people and their jobs, yeah. and they and they yep. do it they do it all the time. Yeah, sure. We well, take d- a look? just real quick, I want to yeah. I want to get to this next clip, but I, just real quick, you were talking about also the fact that you know you mentioned this Newsweek using an anonymous account uh, from you know from a right wing or an anti right wing watch you know kind of thing as their but source. You were telling yeah. me before the show, yeah, that before for the source, they're going just with Antifa Press. Yep. As the sources, and not even with other members of the press that might be there, not even with bystanders, but literally taking Antifa members of the press, which seems to be, I mean, are we taking a point blank value? You know, if Cuba right now had a, an internal press spokesman reporting on the protests, would we take that Cuban press reporter's, you know, instance of his version as gospel? Of course right. we wouldn't. And yet they're doing it with Antifa. It's 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 absolutely insane, and the fanaticism because of the specter of what the what they consider to be the danger of the Trump right. That mm. specter is enough that pe- they don't want to give quote a platform for fascists or platform yeah. for fascism. So if you are one of these young reporters working at Newsweek who writes that story up, you're following, you're in with all of these social media accounts. Your bosses are an older generation, and yet your ground floor, you know, staff is all just out of college because they're hiring people for dirt cheap, trying to get them to to figure out how to get content to be yeah. engaged with and you're getting one-sided sort of uh, ideological narrative and you're not even talking to the other side because you're not going to platform yep. the fascists according to right. that ideolo- well, I was, ideology. I was also reading something, I, I think it might have been in Seattle, I, but there were some meetings between Antifa and these protesters and you know basically coordinating how protests would happen and how police would handle in response to protests. I mean, working hand in hand with these people, but again, like you said, only one side. And not that this was an officially sanctioned protest in any way, but they were essentially city governments working hand in hand, as well as some members of the media, as far as how this was all going to go down, which just seems to me completely mad. 
And, and like you said, it's it's just pushing the one sided narrative. But anyway, so I got we have another clip. I'm going to queue up. So this is going to be July 17th. Now, the police uh, No, that we're going on to the next Oops, one. Sorry, I went to the wrong one. Apologies. Here we go. No worries. So this is the next one. Now, the right wing is showing up on that same street corner, a block away from the Wii spot and in rush the police. The LAPD was caught off guard. They didn't do much on July 3rd. And consequently, lots of people got attacked. Two people got stabbed by a right uh, right winger who pulled a knife and accidentally stabbed another right winger. So that was on <laughs> the theme of the day July. for these right wingers. Rough day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw them pepper spray on July 17th, uh, a right wing reporter as well and left wing reporters. So they've been very trigger happy, shall we, and jumpy, shall we say, on the right from what I've seen. But this is the police moving in on the corners of, I believe, Coronado and Wilshire, one block away from Rampart, where the well, where the we spa is and you could see this is the um this is the leftists and their press walking up to meet them you know they're not staying a block away at the we spa they're coming and the police have, are getting away you could hear the chance of save our children on the other side of the street and pretty soon the leftists now some of them were wearing pink masks that was the uh, autonomous anarchist front that put out the memo to put on a pink mask in order to smash transphobia was the uh, ostensibly, <laughs> yeah, it was ostensibly the, uh, the reasoning behind that. Um, uh. And now police are just sort of trying to shore up here. But inevitably, what happens is the leftists go against the police and they go hard. There are mm-hmm. always clashes, clashes between the anarchist uh, anti-fascist bloc. And so this guy just filmed me and I said, hey, what do you... You filming me for, me for some reason? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I try to try to deplatform you later. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. I was like, you. hey, what's up? I mean, if you, you know, now here you're going to see the police are going and they end up bra- uh, fracturing a hand of one of the Antifa reporters here. But they're yeah, going pretty see, hard. I mean, with they're the really batons. going at it. Well, they've got the baton. Yeah. They're swinging the batons. And there's some skateboards in there, too. Something. There's some mm-hmm. skateboards being used as defensive shields. Now, what's going to happen here is all of a sudden fireworks, smoke bombs are going to be thrown. A reporter there is holding his hand because he just got mm-hmm. he got his phone knocked out of his hand. So the, the the LAPD who went kind of were non players on July the third, and consequently a lot of people got you know uh, attacked that were right wing normies like just mm-hmm. uh, even some lesbians who showed up. They are slurred as turf trans exclusionary. Uh, and the le- yeah, I've heard that yes. exact phrase. Time so so the yeah, the a couple of lesbians showed up and they were had they're like get away you fucking turfs and they are throwing water at them and so forth. And the idea in, in other words these sort of uh, OG lesbians are are for women's spaces for women's. They don't right, they yeah. they don't want the you know. The uh, well, male the anatomy there. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's the thing that always gets to me. And I know we've got, oh, actually, real quick here, we'll, I'm going to play this. Uh, this is the slow motion of the firework coming in. All right, Let's right. Because real Because what the eye doesn't see, uh, we can always be fooled by in the sense that we just see all of a sudden police go into town here, but we don't know why. And I don't have any yeah. answer. People have speculated or said this thing or that, but I don't have any visual confirmation, so I'm not going to say why. I don't know why. But what I do know is smoke bombs are about to be released. There's a reporter there with a broken hand, and you're going to see the guy right to my left. Boom. Yep. There's you the see, firework. See, there's the firework being tossed right at, in the at chest the cop. And there you yep. see the guy in black, just kind of just innocuous there. Doing nothing, mm-hmm. and we saw this time and time again uh, back in May. There's a uh, an LA video of a, a police car going up quickly, and it looked like it was running into protesters. And they all said, "Look, the LAPD oh, wants course. to r- yeah. run into protesters." Well, if you slow the video down, you you have a guy in a hood with a red canister running towards the cop car, and then the cop ad- advances to kind of oh yeah, you know, well, it's like get out of the way. When, so, when there's protest. You have these people that are amped up. Their adrenaline's through the roof. They're there believing in a cause that's right, just right, so they don't give a shit. And then you've got people that are just trying to get through. I mean, every time I see a car run over protesters, I always go, if that was me, and these kids are beating on my car and I'm fearing for my life, I would do the same thing. You know, not to excuse everybody, not saying that's always right, but I think the same thing in a lot of these circumstances where you see the end result like you're talking about and you don't see the build up to it. Well, yeah, you don't see the end result, and there's it's so much more complicated. Now, I don't know what I would do in that situation, and I've thought about what do I do in the situation where I'm uh, attacked in person. Right, yeah, you're, because you're, you're putting the, yourself right in the there. The second yeah. you aggress, and the second, like that person in the car, the second that person tries to use the accelerator to get out of it, they... Mm-hmm. 
you know, people flop. People, f- yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's yeah. worse than a worse than a you know a European soccer game. It's like right. <laughs> it's it's just like people are flopping all over the place. Uh, oh, he got me, you know. And, yeah. and there's, I mean, you see it all over the place at these protests. And so I don't know what I would do because you know if you have anything to lose, you know, not to mention that it, it could be a dangerous situation. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do when they they tried to mob me on the on the 17th. Someone mm-hmm. someone yelled out my name and I said I just. Very very calmly said, I've been a part of this community. I live in Los Angeles since the 1992. I've been a part of this community. I'm here. I am, I'm, have a right to be here. And I just slowly mm-hmm. sort of, you know, uh, and that's kind of the, you got to be the Antifa whisperer. You got to kind of <laughs> just say, I'm a part of this community. I'm right, a part yeah. of the, you know, I'm a member of this community. And you just, community is the key word. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you, that's, that's so, interesting because it's an interesting way to, to kind of, um, yeah, diffuse the situation. I also oh, show up in, I, yeah. Just not oh, sorry, dressed. I just show right. up in shorts and and sometimes flip flops. I'm like not trying to show anybody that I'm a part of any side of this, but yeah. I'm just there to document. And and I get stuck on the other side too. And I saw the right chase a Guardian reporter um, mm. away, and they were throwing bottles. Then one of the only arrests that came from on the right was a guy that was chasing the woman with some sort of object. And so he got police batoned him on the back of the knees, the Mm -hmm. right wing guy. He was the one arrest on July the 13th. Then I saw as they were retreating, they maced or another right wing reporter by accident who was up, Mm -hmm. who's down from Portland, like an independent that uh, right, right leaning kind of libertarian guy actually. And Mm -hmm. so they, they maced him by accident. So, so they never know who's who. And what ends up happening at the end of July 17th is that there's a kettle. Now, there are 39 arrests, but those are all of the Antifa leftist bloc, who, the 39 arrests, and then the one arrest on the right. And people are, you know, screaming foul. But no, the right actually, after that one guy got clubbed in the back of the legs, the right wing said, okay, we're out of here. And they mm-hmm. went back to MacArthur Park where they had sort of staged, and uh, they, they went back there, they retreated, they complied. The left mm-hmm. did not, an unlawful assembly was declared, and that's when they kettled them and arrested 39 people. So now, that's the, the story. The question always is, yeah. in L.A., you know, right, we've got, uh, was it Gascon, right, as our, uh, our DA? Uh, right. Or Gascoigne? Am I saying that correctly? Um, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, super. he's a super leftist DA, and he has right. uh, he's made it pretty much policy. All of the rioters, you know, George Floyd and on on up, he has made it almost a policy to not press charges on these people. So the question is, I'm curious to see if the one right winger that was arrested and the 39 black blockers arrested, who maintains those charges? Because I would be surprised if all of the Antifa weren't let go and the one right winger was kept in jail. And that's <laughs> that's going I'm uh, yeah, I need to uh, follow up on that and see and see because, yeah. it, you know, it's it's, it's definitely interesting. Yeah. Yeah. As, as far as how to stop this, uh, you know, the police are going to get criticized because they were they were hit heavy handed. I mean, I saw batons yeah. flying oh, yeah. it's, on the 17th it's... and they did nothing two weeks prior. So mm-hmm. I don't know if there's a happy medium somewhere. <laughs> it just, yeah, uh, yeah. I, well, uh, you it's, know, it's wild. It's definitely difficult. And, you know, in, and this is a, you know, a libertarian podcast. I can't say that I've been uh, necessarily kind to police and a lot of police tactics over the years. But without a doubt, over the last half you know six months i have come down more on the side of police in a lot of matters that i've looked at because probably there's a heightened uh, tension there's a lot of people looking at it but there's certain ways in which you go okay there has to be order maintained in some way here um and you can't just simply allow mobs to control city blocks to shut down traffic to attack people to destroy private property and yeah there has to be some time you say okay enough is enough do your job. And like you said, the question is how far is too far? And the problem is you never know until you cross that line. So. You know, it, it, so many people on July the 3rd at the We Spot were attacked. They were pushed mm-hmm. away. They didn't have a chance to express their right to free speech. And so the police came prepared on the, um, on the uh, 17th and they locked down one corner of the We Spot where they thought the right wing was going to, approach from but they approach from the opposite side i think because they didn't want to be hiding behind the police they yeah. wanted to just sort of proudly walk down wilshire and say we have a right to be here and what you see though is is there is an ideal an ideological there's a, a society that's envisioned from this leftist front 
where they, whether they value anarchism or communism, you know, it, it goes back and forth. Some, you know, they're, they're coexisting. The Antifa flag is a red and black flag together. Mm-hmm. So they're coexisting for the, you know, the convenience of the moment. But what this imagined society is, 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 is it does not allow a free press. It does not, it mm-hmm. tries to seek out somebody like me and expel them, you know, and then the right answers by doing the same thing. They, they try to expel uh, the press from their side because they, they're suspicious of everybody being an infiltrator. And so the imagined societies um, that these groups end up sort of uh, uh, nodding to are, are, are extremely dystopian and, and uh, there's no free speech. Uh, people yeah. are getting attacked randomly. And so then you say, you start to you reconsider, Oh, I, I think, maybe uh we do need some sort of police we certainly don't right, need yeah. their their police their imagined <laughs> no. uh community security forces because yeah. they well, are so that's interesting uh, yeah. yeah well let's say and you and you got into this a little bit earlier talking about you know the the circumstances of the we spa and who's out there and you know that you've got the the quote-unquote turfs as antifa call them and just re- basic religious people or basically these people that don't want to be exposed to random penises you know unnecessarily and right. I always thought it's interesting to look at the way the left looks at rights and basically they're they're very specific as far as who has rights, you know, because from my point of view, I don't have a problem if the spa has an open policy wherein men and women can go across uh, or if they have a specific way in which they want to enforce that. But there's, you know, culturally, this has been happening in Korea and Japan for a very long time. There are cultural rights that have to be respected there, personal rights that have to be respected there. And by saying look, we, we respect a, a man can just walk into any place and you know, privacy be damned, cultural uh, expectations be damned, and, and private businesses should be able to run that business if they don't want to allow these things to overlap. There has to be some respect paid for the rights of those people that are patronizing that business. And, and, and the spa, it, you know, the spa itself says we can't, said we can't do anything. They said we, right, yeah. the, the way that the, the, the you know, the, the laws it is are the way yeah, it is. The way shut that down. Yeah. We can't do it. Yeah. Right. But Antifa yeah. doesn't want to hear that. The left doesn't want to hear that, you know, there are rights on the other side that have to be paid attention to. It's no, that's these rights of this. And it's, you know, a minuscule minority. I have no problem with trans people in any way. Be trans. God bless you. Be trans. But, you know, for a 0.001 minority to say these people's rights supersede other people's rights, that's the problem that I have. It's so transparently seizing upon this. And I, you know, I only, I've said this before, I only identified um, three trans activists that were there. Uh, mm. Most of the people were not, but it's the moral kind of authoritarianism of saying, we have, we the leftists have the moral authority on this. And right. so therefore, if you do not agree with us, the, again, you're either with us or against us. And the lengths that they will go to in this sort of imagined society, here's a, uh, a new clip. Um, yeah, thanks. I was trying marquee. to pull yours out, but I would have had to kick you off the call to pull the clip down, I realized. So I'm glad you got it yeah. yourself. <laughs> no, no. Here, here, here's another clip of a marquee. There is, there is, uh, these are addresses that are posted on a marquee of a theater not far from the Wee Spa. Wee Spa. Home addresses of conservatives, which uh, they distributed flyers with their home addresses and you, you see chuds is their slur for anybody who's not them really right, and yeah. uh and then you see the, the 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 diagonal arrows there as well um and antifa socal antifa graffiti was all over and they they named one guy by his first name and uh, mm-hmm. well they had full names there and addresses on that banner drop so uh their imagined society is if you know if you are against us we will you know uh we will persecute you uh, we, they are the moral authority and mm-hmm. they will eat their own. And I've seen it in Portland where Antifa aligned journalists have been turned on and expelled from Portland and, and, and left because, uh, there it, it's, it just goes with any which way the wind blows as far as yeah. who they decide there is with them and who is against them. And the, in the amount of infighting, you just look at this thing and go, Oh, this is, it's such a. It's such a disaster. So they can't stand me because I come out and I talk about it freely, freely and I don't, you know, I don't shirk from it. And I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't have a political side in this. I'm not, I, I consider myself a true independent and I'm critical mm-hmm. of both sides of how they conduct themselves through the use of violence and in that cyclical uh, nature are feeding each other. And so it's, it's, 
uh, they try, but uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm glad that I get opportunities like this to come and uh, talk about uh, my work. And what yeah, I've witnessed. Well, this is interesting. I mean, it'd be great. We actually, we, we've talked twice as long as I thought we would. So I'm going to wrap this up because I'm going to have to do, yeah. I do my current event stuff too. But this is, uh, no, it's been great having you on. And, um, you know, as you ongoing, as, as you're documenting this stuff, you know, if you find something good or if I see something in LA, I'll, I'll reach out and say, hey, are you covering this? Just, you know, keep me posted. And uh, it'd be great to have you on. Just kind of do a little, you know, little touch base here and there and, uh, and share some more clips like this. It was great. Uh, fantastic. And if your audience wants to uh, follow my work uh, on Twitter, yes, it's at, at J Lee yeah. Quinn at J L E E Q U I N N. And I also have a second uh, Twitter, which is at unblocked live, which is the podcast, but I, I post the visual content from, you know, everywhere from Portland to, you know, I was in DC several times, including the capital, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco Bay area, Sacramento, where I saw unilateral attacks on right wing normies and, and so mm -hmm. forth. So, so, uh, you know, all this I have documented, uh, much uh, <laughs> to the chagrin of, of those who, who want to control the message and, and I wow. have been very successful in getting the mainstream media to, oh, to sure. feed from their hand. Yeah, they definitely have. Well, keep it up, uh, doing the Lord's work, Jeremy. <laughs> so yeah, Jeremy Lee Quinn, everybody check him out. Like you said, uh, Jay Lee Quinn on Twitter and make sure to check his podcast out on block live and Jeremy, we'll talk again soon, bud. Thanks for having me. All right. And we are back. Welcome to, not welcome to, welcome back to the regular show outside of the interview segment. Um, yeah, I hope you like Jeremy. I thought he was a cool guy. I'm definitely going to have him back on here. And check out, I'm going to put links to the show notes as well as his link tree so you can find all of the different things he is doing and where to find him <coughs> at lionsandliberty.com slash episodes slash ELL 238. So you can find everything there you need to find, except for life, I promise. Now, coming back into this, we've seen basically what we were terrified of happening here being put into place in France in particular, as well as in Britain. Now, I talked a few weeks ago about a massive anti-COVID push in London, people in the thousands, I mean, thousands upon thousands marched through the streets, pushing back against COVID, pushing back against lockdowns, pushing back against mass mandates, saying this is bullshit. We're not going to take it anymore. It was, of course, as you would presume, undercovered by the media because this does not go along with the narrative they want. And like Jeremy said, though, you know, there were Guardian reporters chased away because the Guardian is the leftist rag of the UK and people know that. So you had a lot of people at this protest chasing away media that were covering it. But again, they're presuming that they are going to cover it from a negative fashion and take the leftward view of this, right? Just like and the Antifa is the voice that the media here turns to for any sort of protest that's involving race or sex or whatever else. They always opt to take the most leftward view as gospel. Well, the British were presuming that the Guardian was going to do the same thing and paint them as being uncouth animals who just simply are selfish and want everybody else to die in the UK. But that being said, still, you're seeing massive protest. And Britain just rolled out something saying you have to be vaccinated twice and show proof of vaccination twice to go into a pub. France had just put into place a mandatory vaccine passport. And this was to virtually go to any public space, to a bar, to a uh, public park, to a sporting event, to travel, to go any public space, to use any public transportation, right? vaccine passport. And if you went out and didn't have a vaccine passport and went to a bar or a pub, they'd throw you in jail. This is literally what they have put into place there. For a restaurant or pub that invites someone in that isn't unvaccinated, or maybe they just mistakenly didn't see that they're vaccinated or weren't vaccinated, I think the fine was like 45,000 euros, maybe even be more than that. Now, in response to this, you're actually seeing the French, the English get out and march. You're seeing in France, I've read all across France, hundreds of thousands of people are out marching. They're in the streets. There were reports of them burning down vaccination facilities, which I can't say I get behind. I mean, number one, a lot of those vaccination facilities are going to be private property. Again, I don't know if that's working the same way it does here as in France. I know here, a lot of private you know, private institutions had turned into testing facilities. It was a way for them to make money. A lot of yoga studios, a lot of gyms turned into vaccination test clinics or, uh, or vaccination injection sites because they were basically trying to make money in that way and stay open. However, 
I do get behind the concept. I mean, intellectually, I'm all for setting on these uh, setting these vaccination sites on fire, mainly because if you're taking it away from being a choice, and that is what this is, this is government coercion at the highest level. When you're threatening to put somebody in jail for daring to go out in public for, and have a drink, and again, this is a virus which we know is nowhere near as deadly as its, as its predecessor, and the predecessor was only as deadly as, you know, what, 1% of the population over 75, those are the people that are typically impacted by this disease. But it's invigorating to see the people in these European countries, which typically are far more socialist, right? We view them as, especially the UK, as, as accepting this big brother mentality. There are CCTV cameras on every street corner. They, I mean, literally, the UK, they come to your house if you post something saying that you don't agree with transgender rights on Facebook. But to see these people out there marching, uh, getting out in the streets, getting in the public and saying, we are not going to take this anymore. That is unbelievably encouraging. And I don't know if we, we would see that here or not. I highly doubt it. I mean, I would pray that if they had a vaccine passport here and maybe, you know, I just tweeted this out. I oppose what I consider to be health slash vaccine fascism. And that's what this is, right? This is vaccine fascism. When people say, well, fascism, that's supposed to be far right. Mm, you know what? Far right and far left are basically the same thing. Just like we were talking about with Jeremy, when you have extremism, it's extremism. These are very close, right? A lot of these people probably could waffle either way. Maybe they read one article before they read another article. When you go so far left, you eventually come back to right. You go so far right, you come back to left. It all ends in totalitarianism. It all ends in fascism. And this is fascism. This is the government taking over sectors of the economy, shutting them down or forcing them to shut down by coercive means, impacting the way people live their daily lives, regimenting society by virtue of this case system or caste system so that you have the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated and the vaccinated of all the privileges bestowed on them by who? The state. Not only that, but you have the state. And, yet, and it's like the nationalism here. Okay, well, now you're not allowed to travel. We hate those people over there because they're not vaccinated enough, right? God damn, we can't have the Swedes over here. They're not vaccinated enough. It's only the French that are vaccinated enough to travel. Your passport's worth more than the other person's passport. I mean, look, this is health fascism. So it's great to see some pushback here. Now, still, I think like 2 million people were vaccinated. So they scared them into compliance. And I don't know, maybe they won't enforce it. Maybe this is all going to be a lot of hoopla that's going to come to nothing. Maybe they just want people to comply and they're not going to send out the vaccine police like Joe Biden was hinting at going door to door to check on your vaccination status and put a big, again, I hate to go back to the Holocaust comparison that, uh, what was it, the LP, uh, was it the Nevada account uh, had posted or the Texas account, I can't remember who posted it anymore. It might even be New Hampshire's account comparing vaccines and the Holocaust. But now when you have people that are being forced to stay home, what are they going to do? Are they going to put a little little yellow star on their door? I mean, I'm not I'm not saying it's the best comparison, but I'm thinking about is that what's going to be? Are they going to come to your house and just put a note on your door that says you're unvaccinated, you're not allowed to go out anymore, and people can come to your house and hate you and scream at you for being selfish, daring not to go along and spreading misinformation about the risk levels of COVID because you don't want to get an experimental vaccine that we know for a fact has horrible side effects for some people. It's just, it's just, wow. I mean, to see the level that this has gotten to and to see the level that it has maintained is what's really shocking to me. It goes against basic scientific facts of how, how diseases operate, how viruses operate. They never get stronger. They always get weaker. And this one's the same thing. It may be more contagious. That's fine. In fact, we're seeing that all these vaccines, they're forcing people, get the vaccine, get the vaccine. I just read five of these Democratic dickheads who flew Texas to go and showboat and cause a big PR scene about the voting laws that were trying to be put into place there. Five different lawmakers already tested positive for COVID and they were all apparently vaccinated. Maybe they were lying, in which case they would go to jail in France. But if they weren't lying, then how many Democratic lawmakers were on the plane? 30? So if you have five to six of them that are testing positive, you've got yourself a pretty big percentage that's tested positive for this new variant, despite being vaccinated. Certainly doesn't make me want to get vaccinated again. 
Makes me think that maybe herd immunity is a much better option here, especially as it's getting weaker. We know that hospitalizations have not gone up. Those are flat. So this thing isn't driving people to the emergency room like they used to be. So what's the point? I mean, is it simply Big Pharma being tied into this? Is it the push to get these people billions and billions more? Or does it harken back again to what I said last episode? That this is so vitally important for these governments because if people reject getting vaccinated, if they reject this authoritarian or health fascism, what does that mean for the empire? What does that mean for all of these empires? It means the government's lost control of the narrative. They lost control of what is truth. And you can see them clinging to it, both hands now, clinging to their truth, their ability to dictate what you think, what you believe. That's why they're working with the social media. Because they know 50% of the population saying, we're not going to go along with it. We don't believe what you've been telling us these last few months. We don't care how many times you tell us. We don't care if you come to our door and remind us. We don't believe you. That is an empirical danger to this empire that they cannot let stand. Otherwise, they know this whole thing could crumble down. And those people in power don't want that to happen. All right, moving on. Um, let's talk about some idiots of the week here. I didn't have my, you know, I don't have my music queued up. Apologies. Uh, I would play it. I'll, I'll get that jiggle queued up next time. But I'm reading all of these books coming out now, right? And of course, now that Trump is out of office, the hunger is still there, right? The Trump need, you still got these, you still got these people, they're smacking their veins. They need that injection of Trump hate and they can't let it go. Especially since he's kind of hinting maybe he'll run again later on, later, maybe in three years, he'll be out there campaigning. So you have all these books coming out, right? One book is from the, uh, you know, it's from the generals. And I think it's like Miley. He's got a book coming out. And I'm not going to go into each one of them because, frankly, I don't want to promote these books. I don't want to say the names of them. I don't want to mention them in public. So I'm just going to I'll link to the news links about them in the show notes. You can click on them if you want, but I'm not going to I'm not going to go into the names. But one book said that these generals were really honestly afraid. Oh, they were shaking in their boots that this orange buffoon was somehow going to cause a coup, that he was legitimately going to try to take over the presidency or maintain the presidency by force after Biden had come to office. Now, you may agree or disagree with the voting tallies. I myself still have some grave concerns about the security of this quote-unquote most secure election ever, which, by the way, another fantastic government lie that everybody knows is absolutely fundamentally untrue. Demonstrably false. But... They were convinced, per this book, that Donald Trump was legitimately going to try to maintain power and stage a coup of Joe Biden and the administration that was coming in. I will say that that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. This is, why the, this is the idiots of the week column. If you're an army general, whatever, how stupid are our army generals? How cowardly, how ineffectually powerless and weak are the generals in our armed forces that they actually thought that Donald Trump would be able to pull this off? A man who, like, I liked some of what he did, but for the most part, bungled through his presidency. A man who, despite having control of all these arms of power, right, all of these different functions of government, was caught completely off guard by all this spying stuff, by everything going on behind his back, was allowing these things to happen, these machinations behind the scenes to try to take him out and did nothing about it. None of these people went to jail. This buffoon is who's supposed to be taking over by a coup. Give me a fucking break. This is delusional idiocy designed to give people spoon-fed nonsense that they can suck up, regurgitate to the other idiots around them like a mama bird feeding the baby cheeps, <laughs> just spitting in their little moron friend's mouths around the dinner table to talk about just what a threat Donald Trump was and how his supporters are still a great threat. And again, to tie into the overarching theme of this, I do wonder if that's part of the reason these books are being published, because they have to maintain this line about Donald Trump supporters being evil, being dangerous, being extremists, being threats to every good thing, every good and wholesome person that is in the interest of the empire. Keep people afraid, keep people out in each other's throats, and then they don't have to worry about anybody coming after them. On the same note, 
another book's talking about Nancy Pelosi saying that she legitimately thought Donald Trump was going to launch the nukes in his final days in office. Think about that. These people are so delusional, they think that Donald Trump, just just for shits and gigs, just going to start launching nuclear weapons off. What during his presidency would make anybody think that Donald Trump, of all people, would hit that nuke button? Throughout the presidency, he was, in fact, the most reserved, the most in self-control, the least likely to launch random missile attacks. You'll recall he famously decided not to launch a missile attack against Syria because he had asked very wisely, what would the civilian death toll be? A question that Obama never asked, and I guarantee you Joe Biden is never going to ask. And God knows Kamala is not going to ask it. She'll just cackle her way all the way uh, all the way through the rows of corpses. So why Donald Trump? Oh, that's right. Again, we have to make sure that Donald Trump can't ride off into the sunset with any sort of, you know, just let him go like George W. Bush did. These people who now are feeding uh, George W. Bush, they kiss his ass, they kiss his feet, they talk about his lovely paintings, they go out to dinner with them. Oh, he and the Obamas are such good friends. Why? Because they're both war criminals who got away with it. Obama was a piece of shit. George W. Bush was a piece of shit. They both should be in jail for war crimes. But yet their legacies are protected. George W. Bush left office as one of the most hated presidents in history. And now his legacy has been whitewashed over. It's been nice and prettied up and cleaned up so that it doesn't look so bad compared to Trump. And Obama, who oversaw the biggest domestic spying operation, who had until Trump, which by the way, Trump did drone bomb a lot of people. Don't get me wrong there. I'm not giving him a pass in any way. And of course, what happened with Yemen was atrocious. But Obama, who oversaw the beginnings of that Yemen crisis, that Yemen genocide, Obama, who had really just ramped the drone program up to where it was when Trump took it over. Obama, who was happy to suspend habeas corpus and murder American citizens abroad. Obama, who introduced the enemy combatants uh, phrasing and terminology so that domestic citizens could have their rights removed. I mean, Obama, who complicit in gun running scandals, a real piece of shit. Loved Netflix, give him another 50 shows. Netflix is making video games. I can't wait to see Hillary Clinton, the video game, where she just goes around squatting on people in a burlap suit. <laughs> and then, I don't know, going and speaking towards a Chelsea? Is that the game? Is that, will that Netflix do a video game? It's called, you know, it's like Civilization, but it's trying to get Chelsea Clinton a job she can hold on to because she's a talentless piece of dump that just gets shoved into these media careers that she fails at every time. Anywho. It's very interesting to see how desperate these people are to keep Trump painted as this, this psychopathic monster leading into another election cycle and just how desperate they are to paint his supporters as those same psychos. Keep us all divided, people. And then the last thing, something we could all come together on, the biggest idiots of the week and using, it's so funny to see the... And I guess it's it's not surprising at all. We see what's coming out of colleges. We see what's coming out of academia. We see what's coming in to science now. Like science has become woke. It's no longer the science that is separated, that is logical, that is meaningful, that is researched, that, you know, now it's all been tainted and poisoned. Now you've got shark activists and shark advocates, which I didn't know there were that many shark advocates out there. I guess they really hate Shark Week, but shark advocates have banded together and they demand that we have to change the terminology of shark attacks because, well, it's just not fair to the sharks. I mean, we're giving them a terrible name, these vicious monsters that come in and rip our guts out. There was a guy peeing in the ocean. I just read it in Brazil the other day. He literally wades into the ocean, whips his dick out to take a piss, and he's all drunk. And a shark swum up, bit his hand off, I presume bit his dick off, and bit a huge chunk out and was like, guy's dead. He was only, well, pee level deep in the water makes me not want to go in the water and pee anymore. Well, if I'm going to, I better be deucing at least. If I'm going in, I'm doing number two. Give that shark a mouthful he won't soon forget. But they want to rebrand shark attacks as shark interactions. Now, to me, a shark interaction is kind of like when you go into the cage, maybe you pet it. You know, you go out and play with a whale shark. You know, you're out with some little little, little lemon tip shark, something like that, feeding them some scraps, having a good old time, not getting your dick bit off, but 
to shark advocates, it doesn't matter. Just like when it comes to sexual assault, it's all the same to these people, right? Winking at a woman is the same as taking her behind a dumpster against her will to these, these activists and these advocates. So I guess it's just par for the course. So happy, uh, happy week, everybody. Enjoy your summer. Hopefully you don't have any shark interactions and uh, I will talk to you soon. Well, I guess probably another week from today. Unless you join our Patreon, which you should do before you leave the show. Guys, go to patreon.com forward slash Lions of Liberty. You can hear my daily rants. Good morning, fuckhead. They are hilarious. They are topical and they are timely. That's on top of Do Nothing Man, Conspiracy Corners, Degenerate Gamblers, which is coming back along with the NFL season. You can play along with us in our fantasy football league. And of course, you're also going to get my Rick and Morty recaps. I'm doing with Dan Smots over at the System is Down. Uh, he is on vacation. So he is uh, being a huge dick, probably having a lot of shark interaction actions out there but once he's back we're gonna get back on those so patreon.com forward slash lions of liberty and also you're gonna get the early access to debates first one that's being recorded on the 26th so get in there while it's hot you can get it weeks before it comes out is brad palumbo who's been on the show a conservative commentator conservative libertarian commentator he is going to be debating a sarcist and uh, it's going to be a pretty good topic. I won't spill the beans yet, but get in that Patreon. You can see it before anybody else does. And otherwise, just go check out Mark on Monday. It's going to be debate month going next one. So subscribe to the podcast. You don't want to miss these debates as they come out. And also, of course, John Odermatt on uh, Thursdays with Finding Freedom to uh, guide you on your way to freedom and liberty economically, functionally, fighting back the criminal justice system, all that good stuff. All right. It's all right. Now, guys, for me, Brian McWilliams from the Lions of Liberty and from Electric Liberty Land, always stay plugged in to Liberty.